think I was a cowboy So I told you where I am from All I ever did was run from trucks And I've never held a gun Showed you my restraint for past when I lost control. I, I never stopped the game. a fighter so I showed you all my teeth I held them up like a monument for the fall wanted you to think I was a cowboy So I told you where I am from I walked around like I didn't care that I lost it The first stadium concert I ever went to was a Christian evangelist rally. I remember being on the sea train with my family from the suburbs to the Saddle Dome. It's a hockey arena shaped like a saddle. I had good memories of the Saddle Dome because I'd actually gone there before for a Calgary Flames game. I won tickets in Sunday school for memorizing the most verses in the Bible out of anyone in the class. But when we walked in, I realized that the ice was gone. And in the middle, there was a wood riser. And on top of that, there was a portable cross. I was looking at my little plastic wristwatch and thinking, how long is this going to take? And then I noticed that the music had stopped. The preacher raised his arm up and he said, heaven is going to be just like this. It's going to be just like church, only it's going to go on forever. I think that was the beginning of doubt for me. I had a bunk bed that was kind of up and I could look out the window and see the strip of the Rocky Mountains. And they were tiny, so I'd imagine that they were little pebbles. And all I had to do was crawl over them and I'd end up at the ocean.
I feel like I grew up on stage and music was the first way that I learned how to bridge the gap with people. And that was like a way to like somehow get people's attention without actually having to talk to them right away or something. You know, like it was like, I realized I could like communicate better through music than talking. I've probably been across Canada 15 times now. I'd say around the 15 mark. There's something nice about riding the bus for a long time. It's like kind of meditative. My friend in Edmonton is talking about how she went to like a yoga retreat and she didn't talk for 10 days. I accidentally said something like, oh, why don't you just take a long bus ride? Like, take the bus from, like, Whitehorse to Toronto. The prairies are just, like, very large. They're kind of very small, and the sky is very big. There's a presence um, of the prairies in like my music. People always say my production is sparse. It might have something to do with it. This sort of like focus on one thing that you get when you're in such a flat place. <laughs> There's like something meditative about traveling too. You're kind of like confined to one spot where you're moving. You can't be where you're going yet and you can't be where you left. So you're, you end up kind of in this in-between space. You have to remain calm and not be like too focused on where you're going or else you get impatient.
initially I thought I was a lesbian. Yeah, I was like, well, that's why I don't fit in, because I'm gay, you know. And then moved to Vancouver and um, met the first like transgender people I'd ever met. As soon as I saw that option, it was very quickly that I decided to switch. Because I, like, I literally thought I was like caught in the wrong body and then I was a man. So I was like, well, there's something wrong with me. It's my job to like really steer people in the right direction, like, you know, and think I'm a dude. Well, I'm banging on your trailer down. I'm banging on your trailer down. I changed to playing country music and then being like identifying as male at the same time. And I kind of lost my faith in both of those things. When you don't fit into like the gender system, people tell you like you shouldn't exist you, and you don't exist. People tell you, oh, well, there aren't people who don't identify the gender. You know, like, that doesn't exist. Like, you know, you have to be a one or the other. I'm like, well, it's kind of like being a ghost. You're like, well, I'm sitting right here. I'm here to tell you. <laughs> I exist. <laughs> so I decided I would rather go by the they pronoun, which is, like, gender neutral. For me, it was more like realizing that everyone has problems with gender and that gender is actually stupid. My prayer, oh, it's called Sunday Dress. You sing it? When I was a little girl, I thought I had to hold up the world. Singing hallelujah in the choir to keep my feet out of the fire. My prayer, my prairie home, my prairie home, my prairie home fits like a Sunday dress. I was 14, the devil came for me Showed me hell could be pretty I had a poster at the end of my bed Kurt Cobain in a wedding dress My prairie home Fits like a Sunday Everyone, every day, makes choices of like what to reveal of themselves. There's an idea of like what's normal, and then anything that differs from that, you're in the closet about. There's times when I don't argue with people about my pronoun. Like I'm not going to go to the border, and like there's times when you just move along, like and everybody does it. People always ask me, like, why I come back to the prairies so much. You know, it can be, like, really awkward for me, but there is, like, a shared history, and I feel like that's, like, just as much mine as anyone else from there.
packs me up and takes me home. And then once we are alone, she says and does things that I am not able to repeat. So by my summarize, I'm delightfully surprised to find myself this hypnotized. That's the girl I love. One of the most kind of tense sort of experiences I had on the Greyhound, I was taking it through the Midwest in the States. There was a drug bus because this guy was like smoking drugs on the bus and the cops had to come and like drag him off and like it was kind of messy and we all missed our connections. So everything kind of got like out of control and really scary like going through Kansas and, and then up north was very creepy. People sometimes do a double take on me, but on this particular bus ride, people were kind of double taking and then holding their glare, and I was getting this really bad vibe. And like it's 100 kilometers from where like Boys Don't Cry, where the Brandon Tina story was. I had a notebook with a Pegasus on it, so I was using it as inspiration. And so I was just making these like kind of Pegasus noises in my head when people would stare at me. Like I was pretending I was so beautiful that they were like caught in a gaze and they couldn't look away. And that's how I like kind of got through that.
when I moved out, I just gave my mom like one day's notice and just like took off. I kind of like cut off emotionally for a while from them, like definitely from my brothers and maybe even my sister. I just kind of like, I knew I had to get out. You know, I probably couldn't have like thought too much about them and like, leaving them behind in that house. Our family was like Pentecostal, mm -hmm. definitely like on the evangelical, charismatic Christian side of the spectrum. <laughs> I have like good memories, but it's mostly of my siblings. <laughs> we were like having a good time yeah. and we still are. <laughs> I remember us like eating like salt out of a bag and that was fun <laughs> one time. We were just like locked in the back of the van for hours and we were hungry, so we just, yeah. anyway, <laughs> like, oh, yeah. we were having a good time. I don't know, it's like you can kind of just play wherever you are, or like... Yeah, like being, at, like we're all forced to go to church, but we like stole a bunch of like granulated sugar and like fed it to our youngest brother and just like let it wash him like go and... On he got chair. in a lot of trouble. Yeah, probably because it was. Like, was. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, yeah, there was that. Or, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you remember like finding out that dad had like mental health stuff mm -hmm. going on or like? Oh yeah, yeah. I remember he tried to steal my younger brother and I when I was six. Then we came this sort yeah. of like, God was trying to save the boys. Yeah. Right before his first like breakdown that I saw, he was elected a deacon at the church. My parents were really both proud of it. And so when he had his breakdown, they were like, don't tell anyone about the breakdown and he can be, stay at like, like a deacon. social aspects. Yeah, there was like a big cover yeah. up about it at church. Yeah. Then it's like... A lot of it would be like after we were out of the house, like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, crazy stuff like that. Like uh, making crosses out of toothpicks and scaring them around and, and setting traps. Yeah, he setting anointed traps a bell and in oil. Yeah. He put like a Bible and then put like gloves like this next to it, like praying hands. Yeah. <laughs> like snow gloves. Kind of a, a strange like interpretation of the Bible uh, or like stuff that happened or, or like. Um, also, there was like the stuff. obsession with the end of the world mm -hmm. was it, yeah. for both of our parents. Yeah. The rapture. So it was always like yeah. looking for signs that Jesus was coming back soon. Mm -hmm. So that was part yeah. of it. But our mom was in on that too. I think she just wanted it to be over. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is going to take a while. <laughs> Even when he was on his meds, he was still abusive. If someone's a rotten person, meds can't fix that. It only would like let up on the medication because he was slowed down. So it was sort of like a slower kind of like controlling abusive yeah. situation, you know? But yeah. still like, you know, just as bad, I think. Yeah. So. Yeah. Being the oldest, Ray was standing up to him and obviously he didn't like that. So he's really bullying Ray. What do you think? Here we go. This. Hide the children, hide the children, hide the children, a storm is coming, I will be a wall, I will be a wall. Hide the children, hide the children, hide the children, a storm is coming, I will be a wall, I will be a wall. There are beautiful places that we can hide Between the notes and the rhymes I sang for my sister on the darkest nights And I sang for my brothers too
email us. I love packing. It's like the most relaxing thing to me. Sometimes in my life when I felt anxious, I just like packed my suitcase even though I wasn't going anywhere. And then like unpacked it. Looks like I have six more pairs of underwear. Oh, no. I bought so, I brought so much underwear. Eight, nine, ten. Traveling alone. I kind of boiled myself down to like, I can know what I am without a home. Alberta is like a really great spot to find fossils. You can see this like physical evidence, but like still around there, it's like very creationist kind of area. Growing up in a religious household, there was a ban on like non-biblical creatures. The dinosaurs were like sort of a muddy area because there was like a debate that maybe they had existed before Noah's Ark, like the big flood, but just didn't make it on the Ark. My brother was born right before the 1988 Calgary Olympics and he died a little bit after they ended. The world of even of his death and like that period of like two months when he was alive was like a very weird dinosaur filled, Olympic filled, <laughs> crazy time, you know, where everything was like super surreal. Like the whole world was in Calgary when he was alive and like, you know, and then the whole world left and they died. Death from a child's perspective is like quite different from an adult's perspective. And then this idea of like death and like fossils and then graves. It all kind of like uh, mingles together. Thank you.
In junior high, I got like really fascinated with Star Trek and ended up being fascinated with black holes. Black holes are like theoretically kind of imploded stars that have like a really huge mass, but they're also like apparently as you get pulled into them, you go so fast at some point time stops. And then there's a theory that all of the like atoms and like their charges on their particle, like the, the particles in them would like switch and turn into antimatter. I came up with a theory that there was like two universes and one was matter and one was antimatter and they were linked by black holes and that the antimatter universe was like slightly larger in mass so it was like slowly pulling our universe, the matter universe, into itself and switching the polarities as it pulled it through. And I made this big like poster board of it, which my science teacher at the time liked, but was like also kind of worried about me. I think like the idea of the universe being bigger than the solar system is like really interesting as a child, you know? Because if you're feeling like kind of trapped or you're not like having a good time, I think it's like a nicer escape to think about how small everything around you really is. Men and women have very strong roles in the church. What really struck me was the hypocrisy in my own family. Like, you know, having like a father who's supposed to be a spiritual leader in your home and then be like such a tyrant. I can remember, you know, being like, oh, this is boring and then I'm gonna grow up and I'm gonna have all these kids and like some guy's gonna be like the Lord of me and that's gonna be the other Lord that's God and it's just gonna go on and on and we're gonna be at church the whole time and then we're gonna die. And then we're gonna go up to heaven and do the same thing, only no breaks. Seemed like a crappy deal. church itself was very focused on end times. Like all of the things we were living were being tied to the end of the world. Supposedly like a trumpet sounds and like four horsemen arrive. All the water on earth is turned to blood. Basically, in some moment, all of the Christians are supposed to disappear. And if you're not a Christian, you will be left behind. So I spent my whole childhood kind of like waiting for these signs.
in a real application, it would be more like if you're in a plane and the pilot's Christian and like you hear a trumpet, like, and you're not a Christian, you're not going to disappear. They're going to disappear. The plane's going to crash with you in it, and then you'll die. If you're gay and you live a gay life, you're not going to be protected. So choosing to be gay for me was like it was a moment where I had to like deny all of my training and try to decide that I didn't believe in it. I'd have like panic attacks about it. The heater would go off, and I'd think it was a trumpet. I definitely like cast it off at some point, like that as a worry. I think it's like you can't live in both worlds. If you're going to be queer and you're in a Christian home, that's not going to accept you. Or like if you're in a home like mine, that's like very messed up and you'd probably have to leave anyway. Um, you need to be able to take care of yourself, right? So you don't have room to like worry about that. It's like you're gambling, right? You're like, well, I am attracted to someone of the same sex, and I feel that that is not wrong. So I'm going to gamble an eternity in hell and like a trumpet sound and being like on a plane that crashes to like pursue this. It was, like it felt very dramatic, and I guess I must have really wanted to date that person. I didn't really make any friends that I liked until I met Ray. We were both kind of outcasts. Ray was right, sat right in front of me or right behind me, I think right in front of me, and um, started harassing me on a regular basis by doing uh, impish things like sawing my eraser in half. I was kind of a goody two-shoes, so there was something really fascinating. I think I was a bit of a show-off when I was younger. I don't know what my impression was, but I knew I wanted to show off. I think I was a little bit intimidated by Ray, just because <laughs> Ray was really cool. <laughs> Ray wore a trench coat and, like, had dyed their hair black. I mean, I had black hair, but it was natural, so, you know, it wasn't cool. Um, and just, Ray just seemed like a really cool kid. And, um, I like don't know. Ali Sheedy in Breakfast Club? Yeah. Except for the dandruff. Except for the dandruff. <laughs> you didn't have the dandruff. In my book, I changed all the names into like fictional names just in case people didn't want to be like identified. But it turns out that Sandhya actually wants to, so she might be changing her name to Rina. And she's here tonight. <laughs> I met Rina because our last names were near each other in the alphabet. We had to pair up and work on a project about current social issues, and Rina and I decided to work together. When the topics were pulled out of the hat, we got schizophrenia. At least I know a lot about that, I thought. I met up with Rena at the public library. Although we hadn't been friends for long, she could tell something was off. What's going on with you today, she said. You're really quiet. I don't feel well, I mumbled. Come on, you don't seem sick. Did something happen? My dad's a schizophrenic, I whispered. I found out when I was 11. Every once in a while, he flips out and ends up in the hospital. Yesterday, it happened again. Listen. I'll do the research and write the text, she said. How about you just draw and color pictures of brains for our poster? Since Rena knew about my father, I stopped hiding other things from her. On one of the last days of school in June in grade 11, I shakily wrote out a note. In it, I put two questions. The first was, do you think you could date a girl? The second read, do you think you could like me? Next to each question, I put two boxes for her to check. One said yes, the other said no. <laughs> At the end of lunchtime, I handed the note to her, then went to my afternoon classes. I knew I was gambling our friendship and all of my happiness. When she handed it back after school, I opened it up cautiously. 
Inside, she had checked yes for both questions. I talk now about how I never thought it was wrong, I never thought it was wrong, but obviously I had some fear, I think, more than anything else, that, um, you know, people would beat us up or something. And they tried. Yeah. <laughs> and, they, and they threatened. A fear. It wasn't like a fear like, oh, gay people get beat up. It was like, no, no we're was really like, going to get beat up. It was like, like people know? saying, we're going to, you know, and, gonna beat and, you up. and worse. <laughs> and worse, so yeah. yeah. It was like a real fear. Rooted in real, actual, threats. literal threats. <laughs> and rocks. <laughs> yeah. I always have my guitar at school. Yeah, I remember one day you invited me down to the stairwell, actually. And it wasn't a move at that point, because I don't think I knew that it would work. I don't remember the first song that Ray played me, but I remember just being pretty wowed. Like, I was already a little bit smitten anyways. A 17-year-old girl who gets a song written about her, I don't know, it just it doesn't really get much better than that. I don't care if it's right or wrong I just want what I want, what I want I don't care if it's right or wrong My first love, my first love, my first love I don't care if it's right teenagers who live with their parents who um, have to not only hide um, one particular relationship but a huge part of themselves. Um, it's, it's a lot of pressure on a kid. I remember once we were fighting like near the school and then jocks came up and started yelling at us while we were fighting. So we're fighting, they're yelling at us. <laughs> And they said something like, why don't you blah, 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 your girlfriend? And then I was like, Lisa, I have a girlfriend or whatever. And like, so I was like yelling at Sandia, yeah. then I was yelling at them, and then she was yelling at me. It was like really like just a lot of yelling happening. That pressure does like, you know, it wears out a relationship. Like it imploded as it, I think it was almost inevitable that I was going to do. It was like a very fast transition for me in high school. Like, I lived in the same house with my father, then I moved to my grandma's, and then I had a girlfriend. Like, all of that happened in six months. But I still felt hunted, because, like, he was still around.
I had like a recurring dream that like my father's mustache was chasing me around. It's like this idea of having this like big thing in the house no one's talking about, you know, or dealing with, but also like a very predatory, large adult figure in the house that you can't like actually connect to as one of your parents. If I try to separate things, the mental health issues my father had would have been a lot less of the problem if he hadn't been abusive in many ways. Everybody was always like, oh, he's just sick. But there was a lot of things going on people couldn't see. Last I heard, my dad was living in Regina. Um, I'm playing there tonight, but I'm really hoping he doesn't show up. I've had a feeling that he's there before and he might have been and I didn't see him. But also, like, to be honest, I was raised by a parent with schizophrenic. Like, let's be real. I'm sorting through paranoid thoughts all day. I'm always working and working to make a living at music, which means like more people know who I am, but it also means anyone can find me. Like if someone makes threats, then you can do something, but if someone's like always just kind of like on the edge, you can't hide. Check, are you hearing me in your monitor? <laughs> Is this turning up now? Check, check, yeah, sorry. to be back in Regina. This story is called Respect the Wheel. When I was 15, I moved to my maternal grandmother's house in the northeast section of Calgary. My fights with my father had intensified to dangerous levels. He decided I'd been doing drugs, so he invited a cop who was a family friend to come over and talk to me about it. I hadn't done many drugs, at least no more than anyone else at school. I was angry after the family friend left and I trashed my entire room and threatened to drop off the overpass near our house if I had to stay. I think my, brother, my mother could tell I wasn't bluffing. My father was against the move, but my mother stood up to him, and they drove me together to the, my grandmother's house. My Uncle Jim lived with my grandmother as long as I can remember. He left home when he was 16 to go logging, but moved back in with her months later when a tree fell on him and broke his spinal cord. On my first day at my grandmother's house, my Uncle Jim told me there was only one important rule in the house. Respect the wheel. This meant I had to be home for Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> Uncle Jim was in love with Vanna White. We pretended she was his girlfriend. All of these years and she looked so good, he would say. <laughs> One night, my uncles decided to play a practical joke on us and watch an earlier broadcast of The Wheel on a different channel at six. <laughs> he <sn> <laughs> That is pretty funny. Okay, he started <laughs> to, to the game by like modestly getting the answers right, like kind of like in the middle of the puzzle, like when he could have conceivably gotten them right. But when he got the right answer before you even saw the board or any letters on the board, my grandmother and I started to wonder. We laughed till we were out of breath when he admitted his secret. We didn't mind he'd broken the only rule. My grandmother and I would wake up at five in the morning and she'd watch the Weather Channel with me before my hour and a half commute to high school. She sent me to school with lunches of bologna sandwiches, chocolate bars, and apples. For dinner, she'd make all my favorite foods, and I'd try to eat everything she put on my plate. I started sleeping again, too. 
And my grandmother accepted me far more than my parents ever did. She never liked my father. We shared the same opinion. He was a tyrant. My mother is a steeple and my father is a stalker. They come to me at night and speak in tongues. They tell me that we have the same fire over our around the corner car the red car blue car His looming figure is something that it's still there, but I'm getting less scared of. I think I realized over the past year, like, oh, I'm his worst fear. Like, think about it. You do all these things, and then to this tiny person, and then they grow up into an adult. And then they're an adult, too, and you're scared of adults. Like, that has got to be his worst fear.
You won't see it until it's too late. Rolling from you in some unnamed way. Love is a hunter. Love is a hunter. Often when I'm homesick on tour, I don't really think about Calgary. Many times I've closed my eyes and I picture myself at the foot of the Athabasca Glacier.
When you get to the top, you can crouch underneath the glacier and you can look up and you can see light. But it doesn't look like the light, you know, directly from the sun. It's traveled through kilometers of ice and um, it's very, very blue. It's this sort of like blue glow. And that's the glow that I think about when I'm homesick. It's like a very calm memory for me and I can crawl inside of it. But you know, when I'm on an airplane or a Greyhound or a train, the short answer to like, where are you from is not, I live in the blue glow on a glacier on the top of a mountain in Alberta. I usually just say Calgary. Just in time 